somewhere along the way, you lose wanting to be known. You desire not to be known. You want to just serve the Lord and let you be known in heaven, you know, not here on earth. Well, you're never really alone anymore. You've got somebody else with you, <laughs> you know. So you're not really alone. How does one enjoy solitude, this rare solitude, being hidden for 30 years? Well, it, hmm, I don't know. I think maybe I was always, always meant for it. in a log cabin in Texas, the heavens opened, and Anna Roundtree was swept up in the spirit. It was on a significant day, the eve of Hanukkah, otherwise known as the Festival of Lights, that she was ushered into the celestial realms, even to the very throne of the Father. Thereupon, she began visiting heaven on a daily basis, 
witnessing sights that she could not begin to conceive or even imagine. But the Lord had prepared her to expect this. Her visits to heaven had been prophesied many years prior by the prophet Bob Jones. Bob Jones passed away in 2014 and was often regarded as one of the greatest prophets in the modern era with an extraordinary record of fulfilled prophecies. Bob told Anna, you will receive a visitation. You will be in a cabin in the season of Hanukkah when you receive this visitation. His words came to fruition once more. On that fateful day, the angelic realm opened up to Anna and she drew so close to the Lord. She was brought before the crystal sea and even communed with him where he sat upon his throne. Anna's eyes were touched by the finger of God. She witnessed worship that was beyond her comprehension, sights and sounds that left her breathless and in awe. And then through an angelic stairport reminiscent of Jacob's ladder, she returned to this realm. However, that was just the beginning of her heavenly escapades. Anna writes that the English word mystery is from the Greek word mysterion which means a sacred secret that only God can reveal. God has chosen certain believers to act as his chancellors. And Anna is one of these chancellors documenting her glimpses into heaven for those on earth. She was truly a surprising choice. Anna was formerly in the theater and the arts, having trained in England in the prestigious Royal Academy. A star student, she began as a Shakespearean actress, but her creative giftings led her to become a successful screenwriter, including working on the script for one of the most classic and gruesome horror movies to come out of Hollywood, the movie Carrie. From her successes in Hollywood, Anna would live a life of acclaim and material wealth. Little did she know that the Lord would one day pull her out of the glamour of the world and that she would give up the wealth, the comforts, the acclaim to pursue the Lord. And it was then that her life would truly begin. Before Christ, she wrote of the dark thrills of horror. But upon salvation, her gifts were directed onto an altogether new path. That is to the majesty and the wonder of the heavenly realms. Anna's encounters have been published. The bestseller Heaven Awaits the Bride is a compilation of two books, The Heavens Opened and The Priestly Bride. It's interesting that the heavens first opened for Anna on Hanukkah and the Hebrew word Hanukkah means to dedicate and Anna certainly is dedicated to the Lord. And so Anna does not engage with the public at large. She lives a solitary life in a cabin in Moravian Falls, where she's currently writing the third book in her series. It hearkens to the lives of most Christian saints and mystics in history. Even the desert mothers and the desert fathers, they all had to separate themselves to a great extent separating from family, distancing from society, isolating themselves from the world was essential in order to plunge into the mysteries of the kingdom of God within. I came to know about Anna when I first featured the evangelist Scott Lee in the first episode of Modern Day Mystics. And following that movie, a door was opened for myself and then for my husband to meet Anna. Each meeting has been a profound blessing. I was amazed that I was given permission to feature her directly in this episode of Modern Day Mystics because the Lord does not allow Anna to show her face publicly in any form of media. Apart from her voice, 
she does not present herself in the public eye. As a result, she has been an elusive figure, veiled from the world. And so it was a bit of a challenge making this movie while having to keep her somewhat anonymous. I suppose when one is privy to the mysteries of heaven, then the Lord cloaks this individual with mystery themselves. I do hope that you enjoy these precious moments with Anna. This is the only time Anna has ever been filmed on camera, albeit in a manner that's hidden. The Lord keeps Anna hidden as her visitations to heaven remain rampant and flourishing. She is the author of the book, Heaven Awaits the Bride. Upon being published, they quickly gained popularity and readership. It appeared that the Lord was bringing attention to her books for His purposes. With this gift came a duty given by the Father, a weighty assignment to write what she saw and gift the world with these glimpses of heaven. And they would serve to be like letters of refreshment to battle weary soldiers on earth, giving them a remembrance of their true home, a home that has no limitation, that is filled with life and with resplendent beauty. The angels circled the bronze altar, holding the linen enclosed above their heads. I looked at the coals burning beneath the grate. They were hot. Nothing was being offered upon this altar, because our Lord was the sacrifice of the whole burned offering on the cross. I looked at the burning coals. No one said what I should do. It must be a puzzle whose answer I already know, I said within myself. I began to think. If Jesus has paid the full price already, then the altar of burnt offering is not something you go around. You must go through it. As strange as it was to me, I began to walk forward. I passed right through the bronze altar. Coals, heat and all. Incredible. On the other side of the altar, my father's voice spoke audibly within the temple. Ah, you willing to live a life of purity? Sanctify to me alone? Yes, I answered aloud, the Lord being my helper. The linen breeches, he said. Linen breeches appeared. I stepped into them and I supposed that they were a sign of the salvation that had been won for me on earth. The priests had worn these to cover their nakedness. Again, my father spoke. Are you willing to be teachable, tender, pliable, to stand rightly before me? I will, Christ being these through me, I said. The tunic, he said. A linen tunic dropped over my head from above. Again, my father spoke aloud. Are you willing to be made faithful? Yes, Lord, I answered. The sash, he said. A sash encircled me. My father continued. Are you willing that the whole head, representing the seer, be for me alone, the mind of Christ, the sight of Christ, the hearing of Christ, the smelling and the tasting of Christ, and the response to touch? Are you willing to be holy unto me alone, with the covering of my son upon your head? Yes, Lord, I answered. The cap. The white linen cap enfolded my head. Anointing oil was poured over my head. It ran down the garment to the hem. Suddenly, blood appeared on my right earlobe right thumb and right toe. It had to be the blood of Jesus, for his is the only blood in heaven. 
The angels dropped the linen enclosed. It disappeared from their hands. The 24 attendants indicated that I should move forward. They did not go with me. As I moved forward, the weight of that which was won by Christ on the altar of the cross came unto my upturned hands. I could see nothing, but I felt this and lifted my hands to wave his sacrifice before the Father. As I walked towards the entrance to the holy place, I heard the 24 elders and the four living creatures began to sing. Good morning. <laughs> so wonderful to be with you again. Thank you. It's good to see you too. Believe me. It's always here helping me with the cameras. And we arrived in the Carolinas yesterday. So excited to meet you. It's a privilege and an honor. And we are very grateful. Oh, please. <laughs> How may I help you? Well, there's so much I would love to, and the body of Christ would love to hear from you. You have led such an unusual life. And we happened to be spending some time with Rick Joyner yesterday. Yes. And we told him we were coming to meet you. <laughs> yes. And, and he said, Anna, she's a wonderful woman. Did you know that she used to be a Shakespearean actress? Yes, that's right. I did. I had no idea. Could you share about this aspect of your life? Well, um, after college, I, uh, I went to the Royal Academy. And uh, I was still not that interested in, in acting. You know, I was just doing it like you do in college. You, do, you just do things, you know. And, um, but I had the opportunity to go to the Royal Academy, so I took it. And uh, I ended up the top in my class, and they urged me to do this as, as a living. So I did. I began, you know, um, uh, doing Shakespeare. I, I played all of uh, Shakespeare's leading ladies. I was so tall I couldn't do anything else but, you know. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, uh, I did that for a number of years. And, uh, and I sort of fell into screenwriting and uh, it sort of because I wanted to get some chairs. I was over in England and, and I saw these really expensive chairs. And um, so I thought, how can I make some money? Uh, I'm over here and I can't work, what can I do? And I thought I could write a screenplay and uh, maybe they'd hold the chairs for me and everything. So, um, so I wrote a screenplay and it was immediately picked up. They had had a Broadway show on it and they'd had three screenplays that they tried to get written and they didn't like it. And the, uh, the one that I gave it to, who, who was a friend actually, but didn't see me as a writer, um, you know, they... <laughs> so anyway. It was a shock that I had written it. And she said, well, congratulations, she has a new career. Wow. Yeah, just one of those things, you know. It was a hidden talent that was... Yes, it was, it was not something. But you see, the thing is, is I'd been playing leads in plays. And when you play the lead, you, you know the, the arc of the uh, action. So I just knew the arc of it, and I was able to, to write with that. 
Yeah. Because you understood the art, you understood how to pull the audience and cause them to reach a momentum where there was a rise in emotions and then bring it down again. Yes, yes. And for what they call the denouement, which is you go up to a climax and then you come down to a soft landing. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord brought you, you to a soft landing. Yes. Yes, I was um, one of the screenplays I was asked to write um, was uh, Stephen King's first book. Um, and um, it, it was, uh, you know, it. He wasn't well known enough to write his own screenplay at that, time. at that time because this was his first. And uh, it had a girl from, um, well, they were going to have uh, Sissy Spacek doing the, the part. They already knew who was going to do it. And um, they were going, and she was from a town that was not too far from my hometown in Texas. And they felt that I would be a good one to write the screenplay. And I told them that uh, I would write Carrie if, if I could go to Texas because I'd been living in New York and around the world for many years. And uh, I'd need to sit in a Texas town if I was going to write some Texan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so they let me do that. And that's, so I went to, uh, to Jefferson, Texas. Uh, an old steamboat turnaround uh, location at the end of the, where you come in uh, down in New Orleans and you go up the bayous all the way to Jefferson and you'd made the turnaround and go back, you see, the steamboats. And it was a, it was a town that blossomed at that period of time. And um, my family was restoring a house there and so I thought that was a good place. Nobody was in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I ended up being there. I mean, it was it was sort of a, a surprise to me. Uh, I was just there to to write that, and uh, but in the meantime, I uh, I thought I might see. I wasn't saved, and I thought I might put into the screenplay oh, something that sort of ran down the Christians. And they were having um, some meetings at the Episcopal Church on Friday night. And I thought, well, that'll be good because the place was packing out. And Episcopal churches don't pack out. So, you know, um, it had to be something going on. They were going to get themselves in trouble somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... Um, I, I decided to go to uh, the meetings my sister and I did. Yeah, it was quite something. And I was just hiding behind people because they had a prophet for the first one I went to. <laughs> he, was, he was, you know, pointing at people and giving them prophetic words, and I was scared to death he was going to say something to me, you know. Yeah. What? <laughs> so did it backfire? Did, it, uh, did you gain something from that? Yes, in that, while I was there, there were some people on the front row, and one of them had a shining face. Her face was glowing, like, like it had a halo around it. And I knew that wasn't uh, something that was special effects or something. It was coming from that woman. And I wanted to know more about that. And... Um, and my, who became my future husband, uh, when he was the Episcopal priest in that church, he said, um, I said, I wanted to, you know, to come to the meetings, but I didn't want to laugh at them. And he said, the Lord will take you any way you come. <laughs> he was so kind that I was just felt terrible about it, you know. But... Um, the, the fact is, is that he said, we have a man that is coming. He's a Baptist minister. He was using all different types of, he was using Catholics and Methodists and Baptists and, you know. And um, he said, we have 
we have a Baptist minister who's coming who has a deliverance ministry. He said, that's right down your alley of what you're writing about. And I thought, deliverance, I've never heard of that. If he'd said exorcism, because I had been raised an Episcopalian, you know, I would have known what he meant, but him saying deliverance, I didn't know. So my sister and I went, and it was quite something. We were sitting there, and um, at the end of these, these speeches, they said, we're going to minister now, and if you're just curious, I would ask you to leave. And so I said, well, I'm curious. <laughs> um, you know, they said, well, cover yourself with the blood of Jesus. I thought, what? What is he saying? Cover myself with the blood of Jesus? You've got to be kidding me. What is he saying here? You know? And uh, uh, everyone else left, and my sister and I stayed, and a, a lady passed us going up to the front. And before she got to the ministers, the Baptist and my husband, she fell down on the floor and began rooting like a hog, <laughs> like this, you know, and long saliva things came from her mouth hooking onto the floor. And she was, she was down on all fours and just <laughs> like this. And I tell you, I was scared but less. <laughs> My sister and I just, oh, God. So I grabbed the back of the pew in front of me. I knelt down, and we had kneelers there. I said, Alice, let's sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> and we started singing Amazing Grace. Well, we didn't know Amazing Grace. So we oh, um, uh, oh God. like that you know and they, they delivered this lady in the name of Jesus and I told my sister I turned to her I said I'm on the wrong side I knew I was on the wrong side but I couldn't understand about Jesus I couldn't understand why you needed Jesus to get to the Father I, that just didn't seem kosher <laughs> it just didn't seem exactly right that you had to go through jesus to get there you know according to your logical thinking that's right according to my logical thinking he should ha we should have access to him and you know you think with your mind when you're not saved and and uh anyway uh after i finished carrie uh, and sent it in i uh I was at one of these meetings. By the way, for these meetings, the only thing in this house that was being restored was a bed and the washer dryer on the back porch. And that's where I was writing Carrie out on the back porch, you know, with the characters written up on, put up on the wall and everything. And um, so I'm here with a rented typewriter, you know, uh, writing Carrie. And, um, you know, it, it was just, the only thing in this place was a one of these restored old Bibles, you know, where you turn, you have the pictures of, oh, like this, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. These pictures are just lithographs or something, you know, just scary, scary pictures, and uh, uh, all prints. And so, but since it was the only Bible there, I used to put the script of Carrie in the Bible and put in it on my, Bible. in the Bible, put it on, I don't know, you know, you think, you don't know anything about Christianity, and so you think it's magic or something, you know, and so I, I'd put it in the, in the Bible, put the Bible on my hip and go to these meetings, because I thought that would do something for me, you know, but uh, after, after I finished Carrie, you know, I came to the Lord. Uh, it was like he said, I'm giving you one more chance. <laughs> so I thought, wait a minute, I better better get on the on board here. <laughs> so while you were in the midst of writing probably one of the most gruesome scripts that has come from Hollywood, that's when you found the Lord Jesus. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it, it was my my desire in this movie to make it so it could happen. That you had a feeling this could 
actually happen. It wasn't something outside of what might happen, you know. And uh, that's the way I was trying to do it because I felt like the things that are here and could happen are really very scary. You know, they can be very, and I can't, I can't go to scary movies. They scare me too much. Yeah. They scare me too much. I haven't seen a scary movie since I wrote that film. <laughs> it, it just scared me spitless. <laughs> you, <know. laughs> you chose heaven instead. Yes, I chose heaven instead. Thank you very much, Lord. <laughs> yes. Now, that must have been quite a conflict, writing Carrie and at the same time having your eyes open to the truth, witnessing deliverances, going to a church with the intention to mock Christians and then getting saved where you would meet your future husband. Right, right, right. I just, you know, we were not interested in one another at all. Oh. Oh, no, we weren't. Uh, How did it develop then? Well, God, when I when I became a Christian, uh, my husband told me, that was he would talk to me about speaking in tongues, and I was an Episcopalian. It was one thing being baptized in the Holy Spirit because when you come into the church, you have hands laid on you to receive the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's okay, you see. That was in my background. But speaking in tongues, ah, wow. You know, that's different. That's a whole different denomination. That's a whole different thing, and it puts you in a different place with Episcopalians uh, in a place to be persecuted. And I wasn't real keen about persecution, you know. <laughs> so um, I didn't exactly want to speak in tongues. But he convinced me that, that, this, that I might be able to hear God if I did. And I thought, well, I'd like that. And so we... Uh, we knelt down in the church and we he prayed in tongues and asked me to pray and I was speaking some sort of gibberish, I thought. And he said, that's right. I said, what do you mean that's right? He said, that's, that's right. I said, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. He said, of course you're doing it. He said, uh, you just keep doing it and, and see if you can't hear from God. So I, there were some questions I had and I was wanted to ask the Lord about before I went back to New York. So I thought, well, I wonder if I try this, you know. By this time I was saved. If I try this thing, if I can hear from God. And so I got down on my knees in what was, uh, it was a reconstruction house. They, they had double parlors and a center hall, you know and columns in front, the, the house that my family was restoring. Beautiful place, beautiful place. Well, I got down on my knees in one of the parlors, and um, I began speaking in tongues. Well, it began rolling out of me, just, whoa. Just at the top of my voice, I was just speaking in tongues, and, you know, oh, 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 off I went. I thought, oh my gosh. You know, and my dog, I had a white bulldog with one uh, black eye, and he was jumping on me because it scared him so much, you know. And I was trying to, so I was trying, trying to get the dog out of there, and I was trying to take him down the road, and I can, you know, and get him out and everything. Took him into a different room <laughs> because he was panicking. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I know I didn't do that. I must have spoken in tongues for 30 minutes. And I said, I didn't do that. And I said, Lord, if you have something to say to me, speak to me. I want to hear. And he began speaking to me. And I knew it was my heavenly father. I said, oh, my word. Oh, my word. This is my heavenly father speaking to me. Just poured out his love. And I wish I had written everything down. You think that you'll remember yes. things. You always think that you'll you remember. You always think you will remember. Mm. And there were only a few things that I remember, you know. Mm. And so anyway, I he spoke for quite some time 
uh, about my future. And part of it was that I was going to be marrying the minister of that church. <laughs> well, I thought, what the, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, we don't even look at each other. Uh, wow. Wow. Well, but when he said it, you know, when you're newly saved, you're so much more accepting. You start thinking things through later. But at the first, when you're saved, if God says it, this is it, you know. So I thought, well, I, this must be the man for me. I immediately fell in love with him because God said it. God said it and love actually is a decision. You know, it is a decision that you make. And so I just fell in love with him, began to lose weight and hide behind the doors. And, you know, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't look at him, <laughs> Not, you know, flustered and all this kind of thing. Playful Anna, I would have loved to have seen Oh that. my gosh, it was unreal. And, uh, you know, just, <laughs> it, was, it was just, it was something. He must have been surprised. No, he, you know, I hid, hid it from him. And uh, if I couldn't hide it, I hid behind the doors and things. It was, <laughs> I'm really. <laughs> he can find you behind the door hiding. Oh, I could, oh, I'd be hiding. He didn't see me hiding behind the doors. My sister would say, now listen, and this is crazy. I said, I just can't see him. I just can't see him. I'm just so funny. <laughs> you know. Anyway, he said not to tell him that uh, he would tell him. And so I needed to go back to New York. I had uh, the most fabulous apartment in the world down in New York. You know? <laughs> and uh, I'd waited a long time to get it. And now, now I had it. It was, oh, it was a parlor floor in a brownstone with marble fireplaces and 15 foot ceilings and indoor. Oh, it was just oh fabulous. And in the in it was in it was down uh, on Eleventh Street. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful street. Very neighborhoody, you know. Very, uh, you know. I. It was just fabulous. Sounds like you would have had a, a great time walking out. Oh, everybody yes, I had to walk my dog, walked him around the park. There was this, uh, what was his name, James Beard. James Beard was on the other side of the, the block. And uh, I used to take my dog by, walk him by the, you know, where he threw out his garbage so he could smell really some high-class garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I I loved it. And uh, Dustin Hoffman lived next on the block next, the next block over. But this was a period of time. This was uh, the the '60s, you know. And of course, when I met my husband, who was in the '70s, but but they were blowing things up, and uh, they blew up a brownstone that was right next door to. Dustin Hoffman, he moved away. And then they blew up a church. My mother would call, she said, and you've got to get out of there, it's dangerous. I said, mother, that was a block over. <laughs> what, <block Well>, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sounds like you have some practice living in the Middle East. Oh boy, I tell you, it was something. But it was just, it was the times, but it was an, actually a very innocent time. Uh, we were just innocents, you know. We were the flower children. And uh, people were, you know, barefoot, walking barefoot on on uh, the streets of New York. And, you know, people with flowers, and they were begging and things, and you gave them everything. Oh, it was just, but it, there was an innocence to it, the real innocence to it that isn't now. Oh, what a different world we live in now. What a different world, but we unfortunately, we were part of that change, unfortunately, yeah. It sounds like you had a very beautiful time in New York. Oh, I had a wonderful time. I loved it. I absolutely adored it. My friends were, they were all 
great, incredibly gifted people, you know, and uh, you could, you know, drop backstage in the in the theaters in New York and go see your friends, and you were you went to, uh, you know, previews of things free. They wanted to hear how you felt about stuff, and it was. It was, it was a small community of artistic people that were in the movie business and the theater. And so it was, it was great. So let's fast forward to this completely altogether different reality that we have today. You married your husband, you entered the ministry. <laughs> After I became a Christian, yes. Yes, and not only did you become a Christian and enter the ministry, but you are taken into heavenly encounters. I mean, it's a dramatic leap from where you were in Hollywood to where you are now. It's the, it's the polar opposite of where you started. So the Lord really catapulted you through the entirety of your life. Yes, it was, but there was 20 years in between. Uh, I was told when I became a Christian, heard from the Lord the first time, that I would be seeing into heaven. I must say, that was what I didn't believe, because I felt I was too usual, you know? Yeah, really usual. I mean, you can, there are some people that are, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, but I'm, I'm just not, I'm just very plain. And so um, I, I couldn't see that I was going to be doing something like that. That was too extraordinary. Um, so it was actually uh, 20 years later when he opened the heavens for me. So I had plenty of time being in the ministry, being a minister's wife, helping with all of those things, yeah. you know. So when your husband realized that you were the woman that God had chosen, what was it like when you interacted with each other from that point? Well, um, it was strange. Um, yeah, I was ready to go back to New York. I said, look, Lord, uh, I've stayed down here long enough. My agent uh, people are writing in. They've seen the screenplay of Carrie. They want me to, uh, even though I, I took my name off of it, um, my agent and other people, you know, they, everyone knew who wrote it. Uh, but I felt that I was going to be, even before he had proposed, that I, I believed the Lord, that I was going to be marrying a minister, and I couldn't have my name on that particular screenplay. Wow. It was too, you know, I, I felt like I had done my work <laughs> well, you know, and uh, I couldn't do it, and so I took it off. So, um, but I was, I needed to go back and, and get my, get work going um, and everything because I was getting offers to write. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I eventually, after Christmas, I said to, to uh, the Lord, I said, look, I've got to go back. I've waited long enough for this man and and uh, you said you speak to him, and, and if you have, he hasn't done anything about it, and so I need to go back. And uh, the telephone rang. I picked it up, and it was Albert. He said, may I come over and see you? I said, okay. So he came over, and this was in January, and it was these, these houses that were built right after the Civil War they, they had uh, no insulation. And so little cracks in the floor, in the winter it was really cold. So we went back into the kitchen area, which had at one time been detached from the house, and uh, turned on the oven and put our feet up <laughs> in the oven to keep them warm. And he said that he had heard from the Lord that we were to be married. And I said, yes, I knew. And he said, well, how should we proceed? I said, well, I suppose first you need to speak to my father, and then you need to go to the, the, uh, the ruling body of the church 
and then to the bishop, I would think. And he said, all right. I said, but there's one thing I ask that you not kiss me because I don't know you very well. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he got past that. Anyway, it was so. Um, so that's what we did. And uh, we set the date at, at uh, April, in April. Uh, and, and the Lord takes you and uh, works with you in, in extraordinary ways. When he has a marriage that he's putting together, when he is doing it, he, he puts you through test after test after test to prepare you for that. And that's what he did with us. It was a very hard time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Because you were used to a life of luxury and in the heart of New York. And then here you are marrying a minister. And I, and I assume it was humble beginnings. Well, yeah. I was, uh, I mean, um, he did make a salary, you know. But I, I wasn't going to work because... People were asking me to to look at books and think about writing them and things like this, but I wasn't going to do that because I was at least being I was thirty eight, and I thought if I'm this old and don't know anything about the Bible and I'm going into leadership, I'm going to need to know the Bible. I'm going to need to know quite a few things in order to be in leadership. Now, at least at that age, I understood that. It wasn't something that was trivial where I think, oh, it's just going to be okay. No, I knew that I was going to have to do some study and try to catch up in my Christian life, you know. I understand, actually, because when I met Tom, I had just been saved a, about a year and a half prior and got married to him and suddenly I was in ministry and I felt I need to catch up. That's right. You need to catch up. You, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. How can you lead if you don't know anything? Right. You know? And so uh, the Lord gave one year, which is in the Bible. I didn't know that at the time, but he gave a year. And then he actually uh, just absolutely opened the doors. The church only had about 15 people in it. And after the year, he just opened the doors and we had this huge revival. And the place just packed out and there were 150 children. This is a small church, you know. We, had, we were sticking them everywhere in the corners and things. And uh, it was just, um, it was really an incredible experience. This, this revival. But my husband had come from the beginning of the charismatic revival that was down in Houston at the Church of the Redeemer, where 12 people prayed in the charismatic revival. And so he was accustomed to revival, but um, I didn't know anything about it. All, all of these things were new, yeah. you know. Brand new. Brand new. upon being saved and entering ministry with your husband to get to know the Word of God, to master it, because that was essential. Well, I was raised in the church, as most in America are, mm -hmm. but I wasn't a Christian, and I didn't study the Bible. I mean, I went to Sunday school, you know, and I heard the little stories and everything, saw felt, those felt things, you know, felt board stories. There was a lady that did felt board stories. I can even see them now. But as far as understanding the word or even understanding that you, that you actually had to make a decision to come to Christ, I just didn't. And I knew I wasn't saved. 
So um, when I was saved, I felt that I truly needed to, to know the, the Bible. Mainly, mainly it was because I was, after being saved, I was immediately in leadership. Now I was older, therefore, I understood some things I wouldn't have understood when I was younger. And that is that you have great responsibilities when you're in leadership. And that if you're going to be in leadership in something like the church, you better know what the church is founded on. You know, you better know answers to things. And, and, uh, I was fortunate in that my husband was a teacher and an extraordinary teacher. So I was, I was very much like, uh, you know, my fair lady, where he's raising you up. I, I was raised up and he raised up a lot of us. We were, um, we had after one year after we were married, there was a revival there just young couples pouring in. We, we had no, almost no children in the church, but then we ended up with like 150 children, you know, which doesn't sound like many to big churches, but when you're, when it's a small church like that, you know, pre-Civil War church, uh, it was a lot. And we all, he raised us up, together. We all raised up at the same time. Mm, so you were like the character My Fair Lady, yeah. schooled, and you had to learn how to yes. behave with the ways of the kingdom and to speak and to educate yourself. Yes, yes. He had to, he had to, uh, he, I think he, if I can remember correctly, he, um, he had a Wednesday where whereby we were going through how to um, Christian life, you know, how to act as a Christian, what to do, answers to things. And, the, and during the, the Sunday, he began right at Genesis, and he was going right through the Bible, building the whole thing from, from Genesis onward. So we had the the sweep of the Bible from the beginning and doctrine and and how to live on, on Wednesday. And we were very eager. We were very eager to learn, mm -hmm. all of us. And that is probably why the Lord chose you for each other because the Lord had planned for you to enter into heavenly encounters and Jesus is the word and the word is the door. Jesus yes. Is the door. Yes. So that was absolutely crucial. I I only wanted one thing in a marriage. I wanted an honorable husband. Someone who was really godly. And my husband was. He was very godly. Very godly man. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful. This may be personal, but have has the Lord allowed you to have dreams or encounters since your husband has passed seeing you mean seeing him yeah. no i haven't um the lord told me when uh right at the very beginning that he was when he was taking me to heaven that i would not be dealing with the humans i would only be dealing with the angels mm -hmm. you know yes so I, I haven't uh, been talking to people or things like that. I would like to affirm that the heavenly encounters spoken of here are entirely different from the activity of the mediums and new age spiritists of the world who profit from claims of interacting with departed loved ones. These mediums are engaging with familiar spirits. This is necromancy and the Bible warns sternly against it. It brings defilement. As Leviticus 19.31 states, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them. 
to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. It, it's, it's very strange because when you go there, you know you're, you are doing things with the Lord and for the Lord, and, and you don't have a personal desires. I was there being trained and uh, schooled, and that's what I did. I, I didn't have something that I so longed to know or want myself. Uh, there was nothing, none of that. Yeah. Clara began to move us to the front of the auditorium. The angels smiled as we passed. They were moving about and talking among themselves. Chabara was waiting for us on the platform, smiling, following us with his eyes. There you are, Anne, he said effusively. This was very quick, Clara remarked. She was about to ask you questions. He shook his finger at me as one would tease a child. Come over here. He added, I have seats for you both. Sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Then he turned to the auditorium. All right, take your seats, he said to those who were talking. You can talk later. He gestured toward me. Anne is with us. She has graciously accepted an invitation to answer any questions you might have concerning her or humans in general. I tugged at Chabara's robe. I don't know everything. I whispered to him. Everyone laughed. <laughs> he smiled. We know you don't know everything. We don't either. So we're all in good company. <laughs> oh, no. I'll step back over here and let you begin. Teaching the Angels I did not know how I expected the meeting to be conducted, but I certainly did not expect to be handed the floor. I was stiff as I began. In the first place, it is such a blessing for me to be able to assist you. Um, I did not know where to start, so I just jumped in. Well, most people on Earth do not believe in divine healing. A mumble ran through the auditorium. I continued. Even those who are saved have a difficult time believing. There was a very loud reaction. The amazement was such that I looked at Chabara. He urged me to proceed. Even those who have seen divine healing have difficulty believing all the time. There was a general loud alarm throughout the auditorium. Hold it down, Chabura said. Then to me he said, why don't you suggest that they ask you questions? Would you like to ask questions? I asked rather meekly. Angelic questions. An angel rose from his seat and spoke loudly. Don't they believe the word? <gasps> the unbelievers don't, of course. Some believers do, but many believers really do not. There was a stunned silence in the auditorium. I looked at Chabara. Give them time, Anne, he said. They're shocked. Some believers, you see, think that parts of the Bible do not apply today, that certain sections were for long ago, I said. An angel near the platform said in a normal voice that carried because of the silence, but the word says that the eternal is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why would they consider the word apart from him? He is the word. There was a great deal of general agreement among the angels. Well. I shrugged and laughed. <laughs> they do. Do you? Another asked. I believe in healing, and I believe that the Lord promises health and that he has paid for healing for believers, but I do not understand it. It is a covenant promise, another angel said, rising from his seat. By his stripes, he has knit you back or mended or joined you again to him who is divine health. 
It is sure. But often people are sick, I said. Another angel rose. It's a covenant promise. As has been said, one needs to abide in Christ. Of course, if a person deliberately abuses his earthly vessel, another said. Forgiveness needs to be absolute, another added without standing. Break the knitting together with Christ and some sort of illness will result. As night follows day, <laughs> they all said. You could tell they were members of the class. They all laughed. But most who will receive the gift will not be abiding by the covenantal agreements won by Jesus. How can this be? Grace. Grace. Again, they all laughed, responding in unison. <laughs> Grace. Chabura explained. There is coming an outpouring of grace as the Holy Spirit moves in power in the coming revival. As he spoke to me, he added, Are you tiring, Anne? Yes, this is all so much. I chuckled wistfully. Students, Chabura said, that is enough for today. Let's stand and give Anne a big hand. The angels stood and cheered as they clapped. get trained evidently evidently I mean that was as a, I was as surprised as anybody else I mean they aren't just it's not just downloaded to them yeah, yeah. they have to go through this process like they have to go through a process that's right when you were having this encounter how was it for you you mean to be there yes. in the middle of that well I was pretty stupid you know, I just, I mean, actually I was used as, as the, uh, not as what should be said, but what unfortunately is said, you know. So, you know, it wasn't exactly uh, uh, sort of, you know, patting me on the back. It was more or less um, letting me, Splat all over the place. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Exposing human weakness, I suppose. Well, yes. Uh, in in the way we think. In the way we, and I must say, that's how I think. You know. And um, it's it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Seems to me that when you came out of the world, it was absolute. Well. I don't know if the world comes out of you that quickly. <laughs> I would that it did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think I always felt that I probably could uh, could do things because uh, um, when I came out, I was, I was getting a lot of, um, like, producers asking me to write movies for them. And therefore... Uh, I had a lot of opportunities, and I would, I would try, not try to do it, and I just couldn't. I just wasn't interested in anything more. You know, if you can write about something that is eternal, you lose all interest in in what is just temporal here. You're just not interested. People think, oh, show business, this is wonderful. Well, sh show business is really kind of a tacky business, to tell you the truth. And uh, it's it's all make-believe. It's like comparing limestone to diamonds. Limestones with no luster to them at all, and you're comparing them to these That's diamonds. right, to diamonds. And, and there's just, it doesn't have any any weight to it you know even even when I was in the world I kept thinking this is this is kind of foolish you know uh, because I wanted I wanted my life to to really count in the kingdom not the kingdom but count on earth you know and I kept looking for things for it to count and it it wasn't going to count that way. Yeah. 
It wasn't going to count that way. It wasn't going to last. I mean, because when you think about it, Ahava, think about it, you say, oh, these people will remember you. For how long? So they think you're terrific right now, and then, you know. So do you remember what movies you were seeing five or six years ago, or this, that, and the other? Are you still ecstatic about them? Uh, no. No. It's not, it's, it doesn't have any weight to it. It doesn't have any lasting thing to it. And you look at the, you look at the, the Roman ruins, you look at all of these things, you know, where things are, where things are destroyed. Yes. You say, this doesn't last. No matter how great it is, it doesn't last. During the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire, the architecture was so exquisite. And we think of Roman ruins as being these beige pillars, etc. But they were actually filled with color. Yes, they were. Yes. They were very bright and colorful. Very. And, and the amount of care and work that went into it, but then... Like you're saying. Where is it now? All that effort goes to nothing. Where is it now? Yeah. And even things that are in the church that are, are based on the flesh, where is it now? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the thing is, is that we don't really get the, the credit for all of these things anyway. It's really for him. And when we get past wanting something for ourselves and just doing whatever it is, we're here to serve him. Da -da, da -da, da -da. We're here to serve him, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Da -da -da -da. We're here to serve him. And our joy is in serving him. Now, those things last that he calls for, and that's it. The rest of it is just, it's nothing. I wonder, I'm sure there are libraries in heaven. I'm sure there must be room where you can view heavenly films. When we create something with the Lord in mind, I feel like it pleases Him. Well, if He asks for it, then it is pleasing to Him. Yes. And it doesn't really matter what happens with it. That's the thing. You know, when the, when the Lord um, told me to write the first book, I said, who, who is going to read something like this? You must remember, this was not being written about. Things like this were not being written about. I mean, this was unusual. And I said, who's going to read it? Who's, go who's going to even produce it? I mean, it sounds like heresy to some. Yo. <laughs> I said, like, it's a good thing we don't, you know, this burning at the stake. I said, I feel like that's what it would be. But but uh, you just can't. If the Lord asks for it, then there's a joy in just doing it for him because he asked for it. And if he wants to do something with it, great. If he doesn't, great. Yes. And he may release it at a time where... You get no glory for it. Oh, absolutely. He loves that no glory business. <laughs> Keeps us in check. Oh, boy. <laughs>
hands open, when you had the experience with crystal clear, yeah. and you were building sandcastles? Yes, yes. Right? Hello, a child's voice said. I turned and sat up to face her. Are you on tour? She asked. Yes, I answered, staring at her. She appeared to be a child of about five or six years old, but she was shining. She had no wings, and her eyes looked old beyond the years displayed in her small stature. She wore a pale calico pinafore over a faintly colour short shift. Her hair was curly and tussled as if from play. She looked like a little girl, but every so often I could see through her arm or leg, and I knew her to be a spirit. She was intriguing. Have you just begun the tour? She questioned. Yes, I, I think so. Why? I asked. I wanted you to come play with me, she said. Play with you? I said incredulously. In my sand pile, she said. Can you come? Just then the tour guide walked over to us and I stood. I was torn between getting to know the small spirit and continuing my tour. May I go with... Um, what is your name? I asked her, bending over to question her as one might question a child. Crystal Clear. May I go with Crystal Clear for a few minutes? I asked the tour guide. Oh, all right, he said. Meet us at the Almond Grove when you finish. How will I find it? I asked. Crystal Clear will show you the way. Yes, I will, she said excitedly. Come along with me. Suddenly, we were on a vast shoreline, but there was no sea. It looked as though the beach was still there, but no ocean. In the sand were all manner of red and blue children's buckets and shovels. Haven't you always wanted to build a sand castle? She asked. I chuckled. <laughs> well, not really, crystal clear. Yes, you have. Think about it. You've wanted to build on Earth, and all of that is sand. When the tide comes in, it goes away. Even the tools for building remain longer than a sandcastle. For the tools are from God. But if you use them to build on the sand instead of in eternity, what do you have? A waste of time, she shrugged. You have wanted the sandcastle. It's silly really, isn't it? I suppose so, I said quietly. I did not want to admit it, but she was right. I'd wanted a home in financial security, and to accomplish something for God, of course, but I had tunnel vision for the life on Earth. I had Christianized the gospel of the world and brought it into my own packaging. It was a bitter thing to hear that the focus of my life had been fleshly and worthless to God, and that I had not gotten away with it. Do you want to play? She continued cheerily. I felt a little sick. I thought it would change the subject. Why are such a large sand area? I asked. Many want to build on sand, so we let them get it out of their system, you know? Maybe if you build on the sand right now, you would feel, I've done that. It seems a silly thing to do, I said stonily. Well, yes it does. However, building on the earth is really the same. Silly toys that are long forgotten here. Toys that do not even gather dust in the attic, but disintegrate and are totally forgotten here. A waste of God's precious time, she said, much too breezily. I had the taste of a copper penny in my mouth. Is it all right if we do not play today? I asked. Oh, all right, she said. Do you want to join the tour? I don't know, I said dazed. I felt as though I'd been hit by a truck. I like your name, Crystal Clear, I said acidly. It's apt. Maybe a little rest she said as if she had not heard my remark. Now remember to come back to see us. We love you here. Do keep in touch. She held up her tiny hands and I held up mine to reciprocate. Light came from hers into mine and knocked me softly backwards. I lay on the air as someone might lie on a gurney or being wheeled through hospital halls. My arms were crossed my chest and I floated down the path like a patient returning from surgery. I think uh, I met Crystal Clear right after, that was some 20 years ago, when I first came in. And I remember I had fleshly desires. 
I mean, I really did want a home. I, I really did want to uh, do something. I didn't know what. But um, because, you know, you want to be of service. You want to be used, you know. And, uh, and you don't know how you're going to be used. A lot of times, Ahava, I find that, that what the Lord does is that when he takes us out of one type of life, he uses gifts that are way down on the bottom of our list as far as gifts go. You know, not the top ones. Not the ones that you've been trained that you've gone to school, you know, because I went to school. I, you know, I took uh, theater in school, and then I went to the Royal Academy, did extremely well in the Royal Academy, mm. you know. So I was I was headed for for on the glory road, you know, and uh, did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of all these other things. So I was I was doing a lot. I mean, when, when he saved me, I was not only writing a movie, but I had been cast as Amy Simple McPherson in an off-Broadway show. Wow, that's I was, prophetic. Oh, yes, I was, I was, you know, I was, you know, they were, they were raising money for it, and I was doing backers auditions for everything, you know, so that they could, they could, uh, you know, uh, gain money to to produce this show, yeah. and I was playing the lead, Amy Simple McPherson, and I was not saved, and I knew I wasn't saved, but I felt I could play anything, you know. Wow! So you were uttering words that Amy Simple McPherson would have spoken. So that was a rehearsal. That was a that's rehearsal. right. I listened. I listened to records of her. You know, in New York, you can get everything, and they have a lot of, you know, records and things like that. So I listened to her. Healed by faith in the resurrected one, and the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, dwelling in us, quickens our mortal body. Hallelujah. Till we live in him. I have had the joy of seeing blind eyes opened. I have heard the first quivering cry of, oh, I see. I see, suddenly burst into the glorious shout. I see, I see, I tell you, I can see. And she was a wild woman. <laughs> yes, she was. Yeah, she really was. And uh, so I felt like I could do that, you know. I could. <laughs> I mean, I was excited to be doing it. But I had to go finish the movie first, and he saved me, in the, in, you know, so... There was none of that. So that was in a theater. It's not possible to watch that? No. Uh -uh. Because I never did it. Oh. They were they were raising money for the thing. Right. And I was cast, but, you know. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so that was the Lord preparing you to receive, even that he was tilling the soil in the means that you felt comfortable with through theater. Transfixed, I was lost in the wonder of him. A pangolier touched my shoulder to draw my attention to that which he was about to say. Come with me, he said, and with that he began to move toward the throne area. We began to pass through those worshipping, sometimes ducking beneath a dancer's arm as we made our way forward. The light into which we were entering began to intensify, as well as the sense of power. As we moved near her to the throne, the radiance looked more like the waves of light in the Aurora Borealis, when it forms an arc of lights across the sky. The blazing light was not blinding, as would be the Earth's sun if you gazed at it. One could experience, feel, and even look at this light. Thousands of angels were circling above the throne area, and thousands more seemed to be arriving to join them. Countless numbers of angels were already within the ball of the corona around the throne, each group all the colour of that particular hue. 
they were making musical sounds by flying at different levels and speeds and patterns. Just as a whirling stick might make a different sound, increasingly higher or louder by the speed with which it is whirled. So these angels, in their flying, brought forth various sounds of praise. The tones that the flight made were different from singing or the playing of instruments. This must have been the musical sound whose origin I could not detect earlier. Rare in its beauty. They seemed to be unbelievably happy, swimming as it were in the glory of God. I too felt this joy forever would not be long enough to praise him and to receive his joy back from him. At times, some angels would fly together, producing a tone different from the sound of those in flight in a single colour. The melodies, like the light in the throne room, went right through me. The music of praise entered me and passed through me, and I became one with the sound. It was as though I became praise. I remembered that in the book of Psalms, David said, But I prayer meaning that he was a prayer, so it is with praise in the throne room. I must add this. With the original, there is often counterfeit. There are certain individuals who claim to see heaven, who claim to speak with beings in the spirit, but they are in fact peering into dark realms and they are engaging with the kingdom of darkness, unclean spirits parading as light. As 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen warns, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Those who claim to see into the spirit in such a manner are trespassing into spiritual realms to gain information illegally. Deception is involved and many don't even know they're being deceived. So how can we tell what is true and what is the counterfeit? Firstly, the only way to the Father is true His Son, Yeshua. Faith in Jesus Christ is the doorway to heavenly realms. It's a clear path and a narrow path. Secondly, we will know them by their fruit. If an individual is professing to have heavenly encounters, it is necessary to examine the fruit of their lives, study their behavior, study their marriages. Does their public appearance match their private lives? It's also possible that what they're sharing may be coming from the realm of the imagination. Are they seeking attention and exaltation from the sharing of these encounters? Are they humble, living uprightly, set apart, preaching a message that's true and based on the Word of God, do they stand firmly on the scripture as their foundation? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The hallmark with Anne is that she entered into these heavenly encounters only after gaining considerable maturity in Christ. She was saved in 1974, and the heavens opened to her in 1994, 20 years later. This was not something that could be rushed. First and foremost, her obedience was tested. After being saved, she married her husband, Albert Roundtree, who graduated from seminary in Yale University. He was an impeccable scholar of the Holy Scriptures and a gifted teacher. Anna learned rapidly from him. Anna and Albert both served together in pastoral ministry for almost two decades. Their ministry was immensely fruitful. In fact, they experienced a season 
that was so highly anointed that they had so many healing miracles, it seemed that everyone that they prayed for would be miraculously healed. The Lord also used Anna and Albert to help bring together the pastors for prayer of all the 72 different denominations in Kansas City. In addition, they helped mount the first citywide repentance service in America with the First Nations people. After the Roundtree's very active and public ministry, they were both led by the Lord to live a quiet life in the mountains and they moved to Moravian Falls, North Carolina. Sometime later, her husband Albert passed away, but Anna continues to live in seclusion. This is the price Anna has had to pay in order to be privy to these celestial encounters. Hiddenness, living in hermitage, is not a life that most of the world could surrender to. Least of all, someone like Anna, who is by her nature very warm, very friendly, and she just adores people. But the Lord has ordained a life of pristine sanctification. Being obedient, she submitted to his leading. Her life now is consumed with heavenly encounters, as well as hours of writing and documenting them. All I wanted was Jesus. When I left Kansas City, after we left Kansas City, um, I told one of the pastors, I said, I'm going to go find God, which is strange since I had been serving him for quite some time. But I knew there was more. There was more than I had, and I wanted the more. If I was going to do this, I wanted it all. I wanted all I could possibly do here in this life. And I wanted to be joined to Christ in as deep a way as I could be joined to him and understand him more. And I knew there was more. We all know it. We all know it beforehand. Uh, those who, who have or want to go further, we all know there's more. We just don't know how to get there, you know? So um, we were exhausted after bringing a million and a half together, people together. It was <laughs> really tiring uh, after Kansas City. And so we took a year off and um, just quiet, my husband and I, in a, a little cabin that belonged to a friend of ours down in Texas. And um, Bob Jones had said that that uh, at Hanukkah, I was going to have a visitation. And I didn't know what a visitation was. I thought somebody come visiting, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, I mean, really y'all, I am just completely unschooled. I just, blah, I just blunder through. I was telling your husband, I just blunder through things. <laughs> and uh, so, um, we were down in Texas, and uh, Hanukkah rode around. We were getting ready to move over to Florida, and um, Hanukkah rode around. And and my husband and I were were praying, sta sitting next to each other and praying, as we did every morning. 
And we always pray the same thing because we're Episcopalians, you know. So we always pray the same thing. And it's easy to remember. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking there. Uh, we were on a small lake there in, in Texas. I'm looking out there, and suddenly here's this angel in front of me. And I thought, oh, oh, there's an angel. <laughs> I didn't say anything to him. I just kind of kept speaking because I was praying, kept speaking aloud, you know. And uh, the angel said, follow me. And I I got up out of my body. I didn't know I could do that. I mean, I was sitting there and my spiritual person got up out of my physical person and moved with this angel. I thought, I didn't know I could do this. This is unreal. I saw him following him and there are these two tall curtains there, you know, and with angels there and they open the first set of curtains and more light floods through, you know. So I'm following this angel. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm saying to myself in the middle of this extraordinary experience, this is this is not a visitation. A visitation is when Jesus comes and visits you, isn't it? Isn't that what that is? I mean, this isn't a visitation. The angel says, stop. I said, oh, you know. So I'm arguing with myself. I said, well, you know, I, I'm just going to go ahead and do this because I'm not doing it, so I might as well go ahead and do it. So <laughs> the angel said, come forward. He was a very pragmatic angel, you know. Now, I've never seen that angel again. <laughs> anyway, so I followed him. Another set of curtains open, and uh, finally another set, and it was just flooded with just blazingly white light. Not that it hurt my eyes, but I couldn't see anything in it. It was just all just white, you know? And a voice came from him and said, what would you have? And I thought, oh my word, that's the voice of my heavenly father. I recognize it. What would I have? I didn't know what I have. I wasn't expecting to hear from him or or anything. I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, I guess I'll just pray what I always pray, you know. <laughs> I mean, what else can I do? So I said, I started praying. I'd say a few lines, you know, and he said, done, proceed. So I thought, hmm, I'll just pray, say a few more. And he'd say, done, proceed. I thought, I'm standing in front of someone who can actually say something is done. It isn't, oh, please, please, please give this to me. If he says it's done, it's done. You know, and I'm just, I'm just stunned by, by being there and, and hearing him say done. Well, I got to the end of what we prayed every day and, and there was, there was, I didn't have anything else I could say. I didn't know anything to say. You know, I was just, we always prayed the same thing, and I'd gotten to the end of it, and that was that. And so he said, uh, step forward. And I stepped into all of that light. And these hands of light came out and went down on my head, and he said, receive. Then the hands of light went back, and the angel started pulling me backwards. I thought, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know that I've asked everything I want to ask. I mean, what if I ask? Well, I ask if I have a Mercedes or something, you know. <laughs> I'm asking all these spiritual things, and I, you know, I may have, may have wanted something else. <laughs> They're pulling me backwards, and I'm digging in my heels on the sea of glass, being pulled backwards. And, and uh, my Heavenly Father said, the way is open between us now. And if you have forgotten to ask something, you can ask me at any time. And I realize that I was given free access to heaven, that I could go any time I wanted to, if he wants me to. You know, so I let them take me back, and we went back through these curtains, back through the curtains, and back through the curtains, 
and I was back in my body and I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I turned to my husband, I said, did I sound different? And he said, well, it sounded like you were talking to someone. I said, oh, okay. I said, would you excuse me a minute? And I went in and wrote it down very quickly because I knew after having forgotten so much what he said when he first talked to me that I was going to forget it. So I said to the Lord, I said, look, if we're going to do more of this, would you make it possible that I could be in the revelation and look down and write? I don't have, you know, it doesn't have to be beautiful, just, or it's not automatic writing. It's just I'm looking down and doing it. And then I can be back in the revelation. I said, because I want to get exactly what you say, not what I think you said several hours later. I don't want sort of an amalgamation of everything and let me have, this is kind of what he said, and it sounds very much like me. I said, because I don't sound like you and you don't sound like me. I said, please let me do this. And he gave me permission to do that. So I began every day going to heaven. I could only do a little bit of a time at first and I would put it down. The Lord truly does the most unexpected things and he will use the most unexpected people. But Anna's experiences did not come overnight. She had to first be tried and tested and refined. She had to first surrender and truly serve and honor the Lord. Anna's spiritual walk has followed a similar path to many Christian saints and mystics of old who experienced the deeper mysteries of Christ, including St. Catherine of Siena, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa de Avila, St. Padre Pio, St. Philip Neri, and more, who all experience a state of divine union with the Lord. This refers to an ecstatic state that arrives in intimate worship. It is said that their souls were lifted into a union with God so close and so complete that they were merged into the being of God and lost all sense of separation from Him. The Apostle Paul seems to point to such an encounter himself in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, when he speaks of a man who is caught up into the third heaven, the highest heavenly realm where the Lord's throne resides. Psalm 115, 16, refers to this. It speaks of the highest heavens that belongs to the Lord. Anna regales her adventures in heaven, meeting all manner of angels, some somber, some intimidating, some childlike, some who were whimsical, and others who were exquisite. Yet all were delightful, and each one imparted a unique wisdom. Why did the Lord give me a new name? Elijah answered, Because you are new, your mission, your call, your direction on earth have changed. You are called now to reveal the Father's heart, but I am to be of assistance to you in doing this. So few understand, Anna, but they long to understand. The world is too much with the children of God. It is as though the earth from which their frames are made has too much of a hold up on them. However, this matter of life will no longer suffice. The times are coming and now are already here, when the separation between soul and spirit, between body and soul, 
together with cleanliness of heart, must take place for survival. Anna, there is a spirit in the land that distracts continually from the true. Because of this, our God is sending again the spirit of Elijah. The greatest need is still to know the Father. He must reveal himself in greater measure before the end of these times. He has brought you forth at this time to be one among many, to reveal his heart. When the spirit of Elijah is in the land, there are judgments, droughts, and visible confrontations with the enemies of God. As it was with those who worship Baal, always there will be violent confrontations and great exhibitions of God's power. But first, Anna, the father's children must have a greater certainty of his love. They must be rooted and grounded in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and eyes looking above and fixed on him. You will enjoy revealing the Father's heart, and I will enjoy assisting you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Modern Day Mystics. To support the making of this series, you can PayPal ahavasera at gmail.com. You can also use Venmo or Zelle. Alternately, for a tax-deductible donation, you can visit cardboardboxchurch.com and leave a note, MDM, with your support.